getting into the school that you're most interested in and having any type of advantage is always good. This is especially important for Illinois this year as this is the first year that we're going to be in early action school. So we're excited to join that group and give our students that extra attention and that opportunity to get a decision a little bit earlier and a little bit of priority consideration. Um, that's actually a growing group. So while University of Illinois is just joining, there are actually over 450 different early action and early decision schools out there. And it's important, and I will say this several times as I'm talking today, that you need to make sure that when you're looking at schools, you're being very specific to the institution that you're looking at because you will notice some subtle differences between the different types of programs. So we're going to actually start with talking about some of the similarities between early action and early decision programs because they do have a lot of similarities and at the core they are both early application programs, a way for you to submit your application a little bit earlier that shows the university that you have a special interest in that college, that program that you're applying to and a focus possibly on even attending that school. That's always something that's good to see for schools. We're very interested in having students who are interested in us. So if you're looking at early action or early decision programs, you're going to be seeing decisions or date deadlines that are usually going to be November 1st or mid-October. There will be some exceptions to that. So if you're looking at ED2 programs, so that might be a little bit later in the cycle. But you're also going to see schools that don't necessarily fall on those same deadlines. So while the University of Illinois has a November 1st early action deadline, there are other schools that have other deadlines. So for example, Florida State University has an October 19th early application deadline. That's a little bit off from the norm, which is why, again, it's important that you're making sure to check individual schools for their individual deadlines. Other things that you need, other things that you need to remember with that earlier application deadline is generally to qualify for early application or early decision, you also need to have your test scores in the office of that school that you're applying to early as well. And while it would be fantastic if when you set the test scores they arrived in our offices immediately, that's not necessarily the case. And so we highly recommend that you send your test scores very early for those schools so there's plenty of time for them to get into their systems, to get matched to your file, so that everything's in that office and completed by that early action deadline. For Illinois, we were actually recommending that students applying early action have everything submitted and sent from the testing agency side by the 5th of October. Um, that's not to say that October test dates wouldn't reach a school on time, but since there are instances where tests could be delayed, we were recommending that students submit things much earlier. You can check with individual schools again to see if the early if the October test date is going to reach them on time. Um, in addition, another big similarity is that generally speaking, there's going to be some kind of benefit for you applying early action or early decision. Now the benefit could vary. It could be that the benefit is some kind of priority consideration. I would say in the majority of cases this is going to be true. That by applying early, the school will give you some type of additional consideration. I know at the University of Illinois, what we will be doing is if a student applies early action and we're comparing them against a student who didn't apply early action, then we would give them additional consideration. So if, for example, we had one spot left, which doesn't usually happen, but we'll say for the case of argument that this is what's happening, one spot left, two students were almost identical, and one applied early action, one didn't. If it was for a competitive program, we would take the early action applicant over the student who didn't. And generally, again, you're going to find that that's going to be the case at a lot of schools, but you need to make sure you're checking individually. Uh, other things that are going to be a benefit is kind of nice to get these things done early so that you don't have to worry about them a little bit later on. And also, early action and early decision both give you an earlier decision from the school. So you could be finding out in December, January, February, which schools have accepted you. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the subtleties with that and the things that you'll need to remember, especially with early decision. But having that decision a little bit earlier gives you more time to make plans for your future, for coming to the country, for getting your visa, for checking to make sure that it's the program that's the best fit for you, although a lot of that should be done in advance. Um, something else to keep in mind is that early decision is a shared benefit but it is going to be a different date at each school. So a lot of the schools will have, it's going to be December 15th. Um, for Illinois, it's going to be December 16th. So like I've been saying, and I'm sure it'll get annoying, every school is different. You need to be sure that you're looking at the school that you're interested in specifically. So to talk a little bit more about the things that are different between the two programs, I'm going to start with early action. And there is a wide range with early action. Generally speaking, early action is non-restrictive, which means that after you get your decision, you have until May 1st to decide if you'd like to attend that school or not, even if you were applying in a restrictive early action thing, position. So with that early action, you also get that benefit of some kind of additional consideration usually. There may also be a benefit for honors programs if you're interested in those types of programs. So that's going to come through the early action. Also, with early action, there can be restrictive early action. Now, from my experience, the restrictive early action is going to be at more competitive institutions. So it's going to be schools like Stanford and Harvard. They're also usually going to be private schools from my experience, but I'm sure there are exceptions to this rule. Restrictive early actions. Restrictive early action is going to tell a student that, yes, you can apply early action, but we only want you to apply to one private early action school. So if you were looking at Stanford, for example, in addition to telling students that they only want you to apply to one early action, early decision, or early notification program, they're also going to tell you that it's non-binding, and they're going to say that you could apply to more than one early action program that's falling under the um, private schools. So you could apply to Illinois, which is a private school, and Stanford even under a binding early action. So again, looking at those specifics for the different schools can really change how you're applying what you're learning from that process and how you're approaching it. Now, early decision is a little bit different. Early decision is a contract between you and that school that you're applying to that you will attend that institution if you are accepted. When you apply early decision, usually there's going to be something that both you and your school counselor are signing and saying, yes, I understand that this is a commitment to the institution, and you should only be applying to one school early decision. If for some reason, after you get your financial aid package, um, it's just not possible for you to attend an early decision school, it is possible to back out, but generally speaking, that's not the case. And if a school finds out that while you applied early decision, you also applied early decision to other schools, it could be that your decision would be rescinded and you would no longer be admitted to that program. Early decision schools do often share their list of admitted students, so they would find out through that. They could also find out through another student, through a teacher. So it is best to stick to that just one school early decision. The benefits of, we've talked a little bit about the priority consideration, so the increased chance of admission for those programs. Also, the early decisions give you more time to decide, which we've also kind of mentioned. It, also, it gives you a little bit of time to plan your transition, to maybe visit schools if you're applying early action, so you're not committed yet. You can figure out exactly which schools you would want to visit, which schools that you want to talk to people who've attended in the past so that you can get a more deep experience understanding of that school. It also gives you time to focus on other things. Your final year in school gets very, very busy, and I'm sure you know that. Applying for schools is another thing on that list of things to do. So by applying early, you don't have to worry as much about that 
in the coming weeks. So I always push that for students, especially at Illinois, where early action is non-binding and non-restrictive. Get it done early, focus on other things that you have to do or other applications that you need to submit at later dates. But with that, there are things that you need to be aware of. Some of those restrictions can cause issues for you. So if you've applied to a program like Stanford Early Action, where they're telling you, no, only one, and then you also apply to Harvard Early Action, that could be a problem. You could not get admitted to either program because of that. Also, you need to remember that there are always opportunities where a school may not be able to give you that decision on the deadline. So obviously it's our goal, if we've told you that you're applying early action, early decision, you're going to get your decision at an earlier date to give you a final decision. But there's also the chance that your decision could be deferred to a later date until after we've seen the general application pool. Usually it's because we need more time to look over your qualifications. But this process can vary a little bit based on the school that you're applying to. So if you're applying early action to Illinois and you were one of a small portion of students that received a deferred decision, we don't take any additional documentation between the, that time and the time that we release our final decisions. Other schools may ask for your grades from the last term, or they may give you the opportunity to write an additional essay. So again, you need to check with those specific schools while you're doing that. Other things to be aware of, Remember with the restrictive programs that that is you committing to a school. So for early action that's restrictive and for early decision, you need to make sure that you've done your research on the schools that you're applying to and that you're really sure that this is the school that's going to be the right fit for you. So make sure that you're thinking not just about the reputation of the institution, but also looking at things like the campus type and the size of the campus. Consider things such as, is the program that I want offered there, am I being admitted directly to that program? Am I more interested in an institution that offers me the flexibility to change majors? Although most institutions in the U.S. will, you want to make sure that you've done your research on that before you apply, especially early decision, and commit to a school. October ACTs and SATs generally you're applying to a program that has a December 1st a deadline should reach offices in time, but applying, but taking a November test score could be a little bit late for some of these programs. For the University of Illinois, if you've submitted a test score already to complete your application by November 1st, we'll still consider updated test scores up until a week or two before we release decisions. However, not all schools are like that. So, for example, I was traveling with Ohio State recently. Once you've completed your application with test scores there, they don't take updates. So you need to consider those things, especially as you're looking at your test dates and when you will be taking tests and how that's going to fall into what works for you and what's most comfortable for you and what's going to give you the best shot at admission to that program. And that is another thing to make sure that you're considering. You need to be fairly aware of the admitted student profile for the schools that you're applying to, especially if you're looking at early decision programs, because you don't want to apply early decision to a school that's a stretch school or that you don't think you would be admitted to, because that is you applying to one early decision program. And since it is just one program and you are making that commitment, you want to be fairly aware of the middle 50% maybe of admitted students, the percentage of students that are typically admitted early decision, so that you know where you fall into that group and you're not wasting an early decision application that you could have sent into a school that you were better fit for academically and personally and been possibly more successful to. Um, the benefit, I suppose, would be that if you do apply early decision, you do find out early enough that generally you can submit additional applications to other schools, but you need to be aware of what those other schools would be and what their deadlines would be as well. So I'll use Illinois again as an example. If you were applying early decision to another school and Illinois was your backup and you were just going to apply regular decision for that, our regular decision deadline is December 1st which is going to be before you would find out about most of those early decision programs. So you need to have all of those things kind of sorted out in advance so that you're not rushing at that last minute. Um, 
And I've said this several, several times, but I again want to push that if you're taking anything away from this session, it should be that every school is going to be a little bit different. And you need to make sure that you're in communication with those schools, that you've looked at their websites in detail, so that you know what you're signing up for when you commit to these schools and when you submit applications on these deadlines, because there are implications for later. And I would never want a student to apply and then find out later that something that they'd done unknowingly was hurting them in the long run or was going to cause that early decision to be reversed or anything along those lines. So please make sure that you're checking with individual universities. Um, I'm happy to take questions based on early action or early decision now. I tried to leave plenty of time for that. And then I can also take Illinois specific questions as well. So I see a question here asking if the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign provides a need-based financial aid for international students. The University of Illinois does not provide any financial aid, need-based or merit-based, for international students. Uh, there are some rare exceptions. Those would typically be talent-based programs. So, for example, if you play the harp and we really need a harpist, there's a chance that if you were coming to the university to major in music that you might get a scholarship for that. But generally speaking, no, there's none available. Will the university inform you if you've qualified for a reaction? That's a really good question. So generally, the university is assuming that if you've submitted your application and all of your materials, that you would know that you qualified for early action. And most universities have some type of website where you can check your application status and see when everything was submitted and completed. And so that would be your best indication. Now, if you sent your test scores a little bit late, and you think they might be coming in after the deadline, it might be a good time for you to sit down and send an email to that university, especially if they don't have a website that you can check, to ask and say, hey, did I meet this deadline? Will I be receiving this consideration? Can I later apply for regular decision after I get rejected for EA and ED? Yes, it's definitely possible, but again, you need to be checking with the universities that you'd be interested in applying to regular decision to make sure that their deadlines fall after when you would find out about your early action or early decision programs, because you wouldn't want to find out later that it was too late and you missed your opportunity to apply to those schools. Now, it's possible with early decision and early action that you can apply regular decision for some schools. And that's not a problem. If you're admitted early decision, you would just have to withdraw your application from those schools. It's good to, again, check with the individual web schools and their websites, though. If it, is it OK if the test scores will be sent within a month? So that'll vary based on the school. Generally speaking, to meet one of those deadlines, we want the test scores in the office by the deadline as well. But that's not going to be a hard and fast rule for every university. So you're going to want to check to make sure if they need the completed application, including test scores, or if they just want to have the actual application in themselves. At Illinois, we want the completed application with the test scores in by the deadline. So if you're applying to the University of Illinois and you haven't submitted test scores yet, I would recommend putting that request in today, if possible, so that you can try and get that in to get that consideration. Is there a chance of getting scholarships in early action? Yes. Um, and a lot of times you're even getting priority consideration for scholarships for some schools. So it's to your benefit to apply early action in those cases. Keep in mind that it's not a hard and fast rule, though. And there's not necessarily a scholarship associated with just students who applied for early action at every school. Although it could be possible that the school that you're applying to does have some specific scholarship. Again, that's why you need to be making sure that you're looking very specifically at the websites and talking to people from the institutions that you're applying for. If I don't get selected by my early decision, will there be time left to apply for a regular decision? Again, it just depends. So it depends on when the decision's released, and it depends on what the regular decision deadline is for the other schools that you're interested in. So you need to make sure that you've done a little bit of research in advance 
so that you can see when those regular decision deadlines are for the schools that you're most interested in. Uh, generally, for early decision, you should have time to apply to some schools. It's not typical that it would be passed, so you should have opportunities. Just make sure you've done some legwork in advance. What are the applications deadline you, deadlines usually in the U.S. for graduate studies? Graduate studies are a completely different game from undergraduate programs. And you're going to find that different programs have completely different deadlines. And often it will even be different deadlines within a university. So it could be one program has a deadline of December 1st, another program has a January 1st deadline. For the most part, for graduate studies in the US, in my experience, you're going to be looking at winter deadlines. So that would be something December, January, February. Um, I would say that if you're looking at a program at a university and you see the deadline is passed, especially in graduate studies, it can be to your benefit to send an email to that program and ask if there's still space for additional applicants. Because sometimes in graduate studies, they can make a little bit of, they have more flexibility to possibly accept a late applicant. So it's always good to check if you find that you just recently missed a deadline. Will the University of Illinois email students who submitted an early action or early application that they qualified? No, we're not going to necessarily send you an email telling you that you qualified. So you would need to make sure that you had everything in on time. If you check your My Illini account, My Illini is where you're going to submit your University of Illinois applications. We just have the one internal application. It should show you there the dates that all of your materials were received. As long as everything's dated November 1st, then yes, you've qualified for early action. Other Does the University of Illinois provide merit-based scholarships for international students? So again, no. Unfortunately, the University of Illinois doesn't offer any merit-based scholarships for international applicants. I think that if you look into it, you'll find that a lot of state schools, unfortunately, aren't able to provide much or any aid, especially the large flagship institutions like Illinois, to international applicants. There are exceptions to that rule. It's not hard and fast. But generally speaking, it's going to be less options at larger public schools. So if you're a student that's looking to study in the United States and you know that you're going to need a little bit more financial aid, it's a good thing to consider looking at smaller private schools because usually they have a little bit more flexibility with that and they can offer a little bit more in merit-based aid and need-based aid for their applicants. How can I know? I how can a university know whether an individual has submitted multiple EAED applications? So there are several ways that we would find out. Um, keep in mind, first of all, we might not care. So if you're applying to the University of Illinois, we're not a restrictive early action program. You can apply to other schools early action. We don't mind. Um, but not all schools are like that. Some of them do have those restrictions. Ways that they could find out, a lot of schools, especially private ED schools, they share their list of admitted students. And if you were to pop up on more than one list of admitted early decision students, then you would all of a sudden find that you are not on any list of early decision admitted students because they changed their mind and they rescinded your admission. It could also be that another student that you know sends an anonymous email is like, hey, I know that this student applied to more than one school. It could be that you were sending an email to the school and you were sending an email to multiple schools and you accidentally list the wrong school name in that email. There are lots of ways that they can find out. And remember that your application for admission is a contract with that university. So you want to make sure that you're being as forthright and honest as possible. Do I need to send official transcripts, a tested hard copy, or the scanned copy will be okay. So that'll depend on the school that you're applying to. If you're applying to the University of Illinois, we actually do self-reported grades in your application for freshman applicants. So you wouldn't send us any of those at this time. 
you would just report your grades in the application. So for Indian students, usually that's going to include standard 10 and standard 12 tests, the subjects that you'll be sitting for. Um, we're looking at just those board exam results. For IB students, we look at the term grades. If you're doing A-levels or if you did IGCSE, we'll look at the exam results for those as well. But other schools have different rules, so you need to be making sure that you're looking at that school specifically. Can I apply early to a public school along with another private EA or EB school? Generally speaking, probably yes. However, you need to make sure that you're looking at the rules and the restrictions for that EA or ED school that you're applying to because there are some subtle differences. However, usually you're going to be okay doing that. U.S. citizens studying in India for the past few years, are they considered international student? Do they need TOEFL or any other English language testings to pr prove their proficiency in English? So generally speaking, if you're a U.S. citizen, it doesn't matter where you reside, you would always be considered a U.S. citizen at that institution. You're just applying as a non-resident who lives outside of the United States. That's not uncommon, so you're in a very large group of students. You can feel very confident as you apply to schools. Uh, now, the need for TOEFL and other English language testing to prove their proficiency in English, that's going to, again, vary based on institution. So at the University of Illinois, for English proficiency, for anyone who's studying outside of the U.S., we highly recommend submitting TOEFL or IELTS, but it's not a requirement for our freshmen, although it is a requirement for transfers. However, other schools are going to approach that differently. I'm going to use Ohio State as an example again because I was just traveling with them. Ohio State, your need to submit TOEFL, IELTS, some kind of English language proficiency is based on your citizenship, so you wouldn't necessarily need to submit something there. So you're going to need to check with individual institutions to see what their policies are regarding that. Good question. So there's a question about EA and ED applications via Common App, and if Common App applications are regarded not regarded as important. If a school is using Common App as part of their application, I, generally speaking, it's going to be equally important to any alternative application that you would be submitting. And yes, they would be accepting early application, early decision applications through Common App. Um, we are not a Common App school, so it's possible that there are some exceptions to this rule, which again would be a time that you would want to check with those schools you're applying to. If I don't get enough financial aid, can I leave an ED school? So one of the few acceptable reasons to decline your offer and not accept at an early decision school would be because the financial aid offered by that school doesn't meet what you need in order to attend that school. So it is possible that that could be a reason. Generally speaking, you need to be pretty sure about that, and you'll need to provide some kind of documentation to the school for that. Other questions? Can I submit EA and ED to the same school? So I'm not actually totally sure on that. That's a good one. Um, I'm going to say you need to check with that school specifically, especially if they have both deadlines and both options. Usually a school is probably only going to want you to submit one or the other. But I would send an email to that school's admissions office or double check their website because it probably has stated you can't be the only one who has that question. Sorry, I can't be more helpful on that one.
When will the University of Illinois notify us about the decision? For early action applicants, we will be posting decisions on December 16th. Um, that's going to be U.S. December 16th. It's probably going to be around 4 or 5 p.m. Central Time. So you might be looking a little bit earlier in the morning on Saturday in India. Uh, for regular application students, we release decisions on February 3rd. So it's still a pretty early decision release on both sides. Students aren't bound to either decision, so they have until May 1st to commit from there. Can I ask about Common App? Um, you can ask general questions about Common App, but since we're not a Common App school, I'm not as experienced in answering those. I would say a good resource for Common App questions, aside from the school that you're applying to, is definitely your Education USA advisors. They're familiar with lots of different application types, especially Common App. And they can usually answer questions that you would have about those applications, along with any other questions that you might have about studying in the United States. Education USA, and they're a fantastic partner. I don't know what we would do without them here in the US. What sort of financial aids can a national athlete it may receive from the University of Illinois? So there are some athletic scholarships available for international students. At a school like the University of Illinois, we're Big Ten Division I, which means sports are a pretty big thing on our campus. All of that's going to be done through the coaches directly. And any student who wants to be a recruited athlete and is playing at that level would need to be working directly with the coaches to really be considered for any kind of scholarships or anything like that. It's possible that you could be a recruited athlete and still get no scholarship. You could be a walk-on athlete and you're just playing on the team, which is still pretty cool because it's very competitive on both sides. It's possible that you could get a full ride. Um, there's a big variation there and it even varies within the team or the specific student that they're recruiting. So you would want to talk directly to the coaches for that. And you'll find that to be the same at a lot of large schools with large athletic programs, especially publics, that's done separately from the admissions office. How do we send our school transcripts and recommendation letters to the University of Illinois? So we aren't accepting transcript or letter of recommendation at this stage for freshman applicants. Um, we don't accept any letters of recommendation or additional materials. The only thing that you submit outside of your application for admission is going to be your test scores, so ACT, SAT, TOEFL, IELTS. But aside from that, there's nothing extra. Um, and transcripts, since you're self-reporting in the application, we actually don't get official copies of your transcripts until after you've accepted your offer for admission, so after May 1st. And when that time comes, we ask for official copies directly from your institution, and that should be everything from 9th through 12th, or if you did the standard boards, or if you did IGCSE, official copies from your school or from the testing agency of your exam results. But right now, you don't have to worry about that. You'll just want to make sure that you have a copy of your transcript or your test results when you're submitting the application and completing it. Full ride via EAED, what are the odds? Um, full rides are always going to be very competitive at any U.S. institution. Um, so your odds are always on the smaller side, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. A lot of that's going to depend on your student profile, so how far in that gap, in that group of students that are applying, how highly you rank in that group. Um, it also depends on if the school even offers full ride. Um, and you're going to have to check with individual institutions for that. You would have better options, again, looking at small.
small private schools than you would for large public schools. But that's not to say those opportunities aren't still going to be available at some of those schools. So you need to check individual institutions. And again, Education USA advisors will often have information based on students that they've sent to the United States in the past who's received a full ride and how many students have applied looking for that full ride. That's kind of the, I feel like full rides are what everybody would love to get. So there are a lot of students looking for those answers and like working closely with your advisor can provide a lot of them. Should I consider not applying via regular decision if I get rejected on early application, early decision? So if you apply early application, early decision to the University of Illinois, and I'm going to say it's probably the same for a lot of other institutions, if you get rejected, that's a final decision. Um, you can appeal, but appeals are generally not successful unless there's something significant that was missing from the application initially. Um, if we were unsure on the line on a student, we would defer them to that regular decision deadline and give them a decision at that point. Uh, other institutions might be a little bit different. I feel like probably not, though. So for the most part, if you were rejected early application or early decision, I would take a look at your next tier of schools that you were interested in and see where you fall within those. That's why it's important before you apply early action or early decision that you've looked at the profile for the schools that you're applying to and that you see where you fall in that gap group of students that's been admitted in the past so that you know if you do have a decent shot at being admitted at that school because you don't want to spend all of that time applying early decision and be restricted to one school and then find out that you weren't really competitive for that school. So it's important, again, do your research so that you know and you have a good idea before you get there. Does the university mention my weaknesses when rejecting an early application or early decision applicant so that he or she can improve later? That's a good question. It'll actually depend a little bit on the school. So some of them might mention things like your grades were a little bit low for our profile or it was a very competitive incoming class. But usually what you're going to see is going to be more general. If you want more specific reasons for why you were denied, you would usually want to talk directly to the admissions office. And at a school like the University of Illinois, if we want to, if a student wants to talk about their application decision, they actually even need to do it via phone. That's because your decision is a very private matter. We don't want to send it to someone's email and then find out it wasn't the person that we thought it was. So you could call our office. We're always really happy to talk to you about what the notes are that we see on the application, what the reasonings that the decision came out the way it did might be so that you can look at things to improve later. But keep in mind that improving later, if you're still applying for a freshman admission, you're not really going to have much time to change many things because most of those U.S. application deadlines are going to be here in the winter, maybe into early spring. So you're going to want to have a decent idea of what those admitted students look like earlier on and which programs are considered competitive on those campuses. Because sometimes those competitive programs, even if you're in that profile, there's so many applicants that there's still a chance that you might not get accepted. So keep an open mind, do some research in advance, and if you do get a rejection, feel free to reach out directly to that school. Next question. How does being a resident of Illinois affect EA ED applications? So being an Illinois resident is pretty much the same as applying as an international student as far as how early action impacts your application. You're getting that priority consideration for the programs 
that you're applying to. At Illinois, we automatically consider you for honors programs. There's nothing extra to do. And then if you are an Illinois resident and you are a US citizen, you would get priority consideration for merit-based scholarships as well. And again, that's automatic if you submit the application for admission. But aside from having priority consideration, there's not much more we can actually give you. So I highly recommend applying early action for Illinois residents and international students, especially because Illinois is not a restricted early action program. It's really just to your advantage to get things done early and get a decision earlier. Uh, but there's nothing specific that Illinois residents have advantaging them more than anyone else. What's the middle 50% SAT score at the University of Illinois? So for the middle 50% SAT for the University of Illinois overall, so we're just we're looking at every program, it's a 1340 to a 1480 on the old SAT, just looking at the math in the critical reading. Uh, that's changed a little bit on the new SAT, but we don't really have a middle 50% that we're giving for that yet because we don't have an admitted class to give you middle 50% with four quite yet for the new SAT, so you would need to convert that a little bit. And then also keep in mind that the middle 50% for the university as a whole isn't necessarily going to be the same as the middle 50% for the program that you're applying to. So because I know engineering is a really popular choice, if you are applying to the College of Engineering, the middle 50% SAT for that program is 1400 to 1530. So there's a bit of a jump there. It's a more competitive program. And on top of that, we're also looking at sections like math in Eng or your English, depending on the program that you're applying to. So if you're applying to something like engineering or business or math, we're looking at that subscore as well. How does universities like yours evaluate SAT and other reasoning test scores? SAT over academics and ECAs, is it true? Actually, generally speaking, no. We're much more concerned about your grades and your rigor any exam-based education that you've had through your school, that's a better judge of you academically than your ACT or SAT scores. However, we do still look at those. They do still matter. You do still want to be in that middle 50% range, typically. So we're looking at both, and I think you'll find that in, US, in the United States, most universities are looking at more than just your ACT, SAT, and your grades. They're looking at your involvement, too. They want to see that you've been an engaged student while you've been studying, that you have interest outside of the classroom as well. They're looking at your essay to make sure that you're writing on topic and that you're expressing clear interest in your program and your school through your essays. So it's never just one piece. We're looking at a lot of different things before we make our decisions, almost across the board at U.S. institutions. If I may, can I know whether FAFSA is for international applicants? FAFSA is for U.S. residents, and I advise that international applicants who might possibly want to get citizenship in the U.S. in the future, I know that's long term, or just generally don't submit the FAFSA. It is a federal document, and if you did for some reason in the future decide that you wanted to come to the United States and become a citizen, Filing FAFSA before you became a citizen can cause issues with that. So if you are not a U.S. citizen, don't file FAFSA. If I screw up my SAT, will better scores on subject SATs cover me up? So it'll depend on the school. For University of Illinois, we don't take subject tests, so that wouldn't necessarily do anything for us. If you had a really bad SAT setting, I would recommend taking it again. And generally speaking, I advise students to take the SAT two to three times, because usually your test score will go up after that first sitting once you're familiar with the test and familiar with how it goes, what questions you're going to get asked, how quickly you need to work on each section, and your score will be better that second time. Um, also, if for some reason, you were really sick when you took the SAT, you can't take it again, anything like that, you can tell the university that that happened, they'll take it into consideration. Uh, it's not saying that it won't matter that your SAT scores are maybe under the middle 
but we're always happy to hear about those extra things that may have impacted you before we make our decision. How competitive is the College of LAS? That's our Liberal Arts and Sciences College. Liberal Arts and Sciences covers a wide range of programs, and it really depends on the program that you're applying to for how competitive it is. The most competitive programs for the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences are going to be any of our computer science companion programs that are done through the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Chemical engineering is through the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. That's also competitive. Actuarial sciences is competitive. Physics is competitive. Also programs like mathematics, that gets fairly competitive as well. Um, so I would generally say those are the most competitive programs in that college specifically. Um, I also would advise all students, apply into programs that you're actually interested in studying in. Don't look at less competitive programs as a way to get into the university and transfer into the program that you're interested in. The reason for that is there's no guarantee that you'll get that program. It's possible, yes, of course. Um, and there are students that successfully make that transition every year. And yes, you can change your major at a U.S. university. But for a student who wanted to get into a program like computer science at Illinois that's really competitive, and they decide, well, I'll just apply into another program like English instead and transfer. That's a really hard change to make. You need to have certain classes to switch into computer science. You need to have a certain GPA. And even then, a small portion of students get to change into that program, especially from outside of the college. So apply into programs that you're actually interested in studying. My school follows state board curriculum. It is rigorous, though not popular. How can let Illinois know about the rigor of school curriculum? So we're very familiar with a variety of different educational systems, the Indian curriculum being one of them. And when your application is reviewed as an international applicant or anyone applying from an international school, it's being reviewed by someone on my team that reviews international specifically. So we're very familiar with the rigor of those curriculums and the nuances of them as well. That's part of why for students from India, we look at your board exam results instead of your course grades, because we know sometimes that your grades are going to be lower to encourage you to do better on your exam in your exams. Um, so you don't necessarily have to explain those things to us. We already have a good idea. If there's something outside of the norm at your school, there is a section in the application for the University of Illinois and for a lot of other institutions as well where you can explain any additional information about your education. Um, for us, if you're familiar with the application, that's on the third section, or actually the fourth section of the educational part of the application after you've disclosed information about your test dates that you would have that. I have good scores, but I don't have any ECA. Will this affect my acceptance to universities? I mean, it's possible since test scores aren't the only thing that we're looking at. We're looking at everything. All of those pieces do matter, but um, not having any extracurricular activities isn't necessarily a deal breaker anyway. Although we like to see students have been involved, we understand that that's not always possible, especially not in some areas where you're studying pretty much all the time. So you can explain that in the application in those extra information sections. Um, but overall, it really depends on the school, the program, the competitiveness, the applicant pool. So it's hard to say. It could have some impact. It could not. It really depends. But make sure that if there's a reason for not having extracurriculars, like your school doesn't offer them, anything like that, that you've disclosed it to the school. Giving extra information like that's really only to your advantage, because if you don't tell us, we don't know. Can I live at my relative's residence while studying at U.S. private or public universities? It's possible. It'll depend on the school and their requirements. So if you're studying at a school that doesn't necessarily have a residency requirement, it's probably not going to be an issue. Um, if you're studying here at the University of Illinois, we do require first-year students to live on campus. So we would want you to live with us for that first year in either university housing or private certified housing. And after that, you would be free to move in with relatives. If 
the relatives happen to be custodial parents. So, for example, if you're applying to the University of Illinois and then your family moves to Champaign because maybe your parents are going to work at the university or at Volition or any of the companies here in town, then yes, you would be able to live with them that first year as well and still be fine. They're usually a, rain, a radius for schools for how close and different types of family members that you can live with to kind of exempt you from that status. And again, it varies based on school, so you need to check with them specifically. Do you super score SAT tests? Is, if yes, do you do it across old and new SATs? Good question. No, we don't super score. But we do look at the highest subscore needs section. So if you've taken the test multiple times and your composite score was higher on one test, but your math subscore was higher on another, we'll look at the highest composite score and the highest math subscore, even if they're from two different test dates. And that's a cross test as well. Although keep in mind that your new SAT results are going to be stronger than your old SAT scores. The scores for the new SAT have just been higher overall than the old SAT. So to see if you actually got something that's really considered higher, look at the concordances available, and I'm sure your Education USA advisor can help you find them if you're not able to online, to see where you fall and if that higher new SAT is actually higher than your old SAT score or not. Nepal were compelled to prepare for reasoning tests and language proficiency tests in a limited period after high school. Will universities consider such specific conditions as well while evaluating applications? So generally speaking, when a university reviews an application, we're doing so in the context of that student's specific situation and of their educational system. And we understand that some educational systems don't necessarily allow for the time to study for a test, things along those lines. So Yes, that's something that we would keep in mind. However, a lot of times when we're admitting students, we need to admit students that we're, we know will be capable of performing in the classroom and doing well on our campus. And so a student who has test scores that are considerably lower than our average or middle 50% range, even with keeping things like that in mind, that could be a concern for us. Uh, remember that we're not just looking at test scores, though. Having really strong grades in your classroom time is going to help your application as well. So the answer is yes and no. We're keeping it in mind, but we also need to make sure that students that are admitted to our schools are within a certain range so that when we put them in classes, they're going to do well in those classes and not struggle. When I wrote the SAT, I assigned a school different from mine as it did not appear on the website. I realized this mistake after sending my SAT scores to the University of Illinois. Is this a significant mistake? If so, can it be changed? So anything for changing what's on your actual SAT results, you're going to have to work through College Board to do. Um, however, if I'm understanding this correctly and you just put the wrong school that you're attending at high school, that's not a problem. We're still going to have the right name. We're going to have the right date of birth. Um, we should still be able to match it to your application. It does happen sometimes that students will have a different date of birth or a different name from their ACT SA2 results and the university application. Usually when I'm talking to people, I would recommend use the same one for all of them because if those things don't match, your test scores won't necessarily match to your application. And if you're in that situation, you should reach out to the university directly. Let them know, hey, my test, score, on my test scores, my name's listed as this. You should have received them by now. Can you check? Um, try to wait until the scores would be in the office, though, because if they haven't reached us yet, we really can't check much of anything. Um, but if it's what I think it is, it's not that significant. Don't worry too much. Last two questions. Wow, time flies. What if I have brilliant scores on some sections of the SAT, but weak scores on a single reading section? How will it be evaluated? So we're doing holistic reviews generally in the United States, so we're looking at all of the pieces. 
So if one section is weaker, but the other sections are really good, then it could not be an issue. It'll depend on the program that you're applying to and how competitive it is, what the other applicants look like for those programs. So I would say it's usually so worth applying, um, but you're going to want to make sure that when you apply, you keep in mind if you were applying to an English program and you had a weak reading section, that could be more of a concern than for some other program. So it's all in context and it can vary. And then last question, will an applicant be allowed to report minor mistakes and details in EAED applications later via emails? Um, so generally speaking, before you submit your application, you should be reviewing it to make sure that everything's correct because that submitted application is your best work. You want to put your best face forward when you're submitting an application to a university. If something changes after you apply or if something small you notice is different, usually you can send an email to the university and say, hey, I just noticed, I'm so sorry, this happened. Um, and they can make a note of it, generally. But for some early application, early decision schools, some corrections after the date could push you out of early action or early decision. So you need to make sure that really everything's done to the best of your abilities up front when you're applying to ad for admission to a school, because you don't want to be caught in one of those situations later. There are some instances where things change after admission. So for example, maybe you are planning on taking a class second term and it's not going to be offered at your school anymore, but you already reported that you're going to take it. There are special forms for students in those situations where they can submit something at the University of Illinois called a course change form to update their application on that specifically. But usually make sure that you've reviewed your application fully and maybe even had someone else sit down with you and check it for minor mistakes before you submit it, just so that you don't have to put yourself in that situation later. All right, and I think that is it. Thank you guys all for coming. It's been really cool to talk to you and have a fantastic evening. Have a great weekend. I'm sure a lot of you guys are going to be working on applications, so good luck. And if you have any Illinois specific questions or any questions at all, feel free to send me an email. That's exactly what I'm here to do to help. And I also want to say thank you to Education USA for hosting this and for inviting me to take part. I think it's a great program to connect students directly with schools to get answers to their questions. So kudos to them, round of applause, and make sure you're taking advantage of all their awesome services. Have a great day, guys. Thank you so much, Amber. Thank you webinar for us so early. The students in the region really benefited for this. And for a lot of students who were not able to attend this webinar, YouTube. So again, we can reach out to more students with this. So and thank you, everyone, for logging in. Next week's webinar is on the UC application system, 6 p.m. IST. Uh, we have organized it because the reps from um, UC uh, were not able to present at 4 p.m. IST. And we would be happy. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone.